and you go to PSAC, Prim Salt Air Base in Saudi Arabia. Now you're going to be inside this new enclave they're building up called the BLII, the Base Level Information Infrastructure. Because the Navy base has three large enclaves now around the world. How do you access those programs from three different enclaves on three different machines? It's very hard. But if that program is web enabled, then you can access it from anywhere. That's one of the great benefits of web enabling your application. <laughs> also, let's think about this. NMCI is coming. NMCI is coming whether people like it or not. The Navy has fully bought on NMCI. There was a time in this last year where the Navy basically could have said, no, it's too hard, but they didn't do, decide to do that. They have put their money, they're putting their people, they're putting their investment behind NMCI. So it's coming, which means that if you have legacy applications or legacy programs that are not supported by NMCI, eventually your funding will run out for those programs. And also eventually, the Navy will no longer support you having dual systems, dual computers, a legacy computer and an NMCI computer. So the question comes up, how do you access those functions that were on those legacy programs once you go into the NMCI enclave? One way to do that is through web enabling. Now, you can do that also through a portal. And a portal is many different things, and I'll talk about the portal we're developing. A lot of people get wrapped around the fact that we are trying to develop an Navy Enterprise portal, and there are other portals out there as well. But the fact is, our key role is actually to push web enabling, and it's much more than just the portal. Our director is Ms. Monica Shepard. If you know her, she's the N6 out at uh, CFSC, um, Commander of Fleet Forces Command. Uh, she's the senior ranking uh, Navy civil servant on the East Coast. What we are trying to do is actually a revolutionary way of doing business. We're trying to get away from that legacy, uh, absolutely uh, dedicated client server architecture, and instead trying to make the Navy go forward into the 21st century. We are trying to break rice bowls. Let me give you an example. Say you have a program, let's say here at Monterey, that has a nice little database. And it's all, basically, it has a, a couple of terminals that you can access in the database and it runs really smooth. And you have one person that operates that program and they do a fantastic job. Well, what if that data, that information is needed elsewhere? Sometimes you can't get access to it. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to break down those barriers. We're trying to push data all across the Navy. We're also trying to push access across the Navy. And it, a lot of people don't like the idea because there's jobs involved. There's uh, hierarchies involved. There's uh, priorities. There's money involved. So a lot of people are trying to fight it. But it's the way of the future if you think about it. When you can archive information across the entire spectrum of the Navy when you can actually access data. So you also have to remember that there are many different things happening in the IT world right now. And the Navy's trying to adjust to that as well. NMCI, Task Force Web, production of legacy applications, all these are happening uh, concurrently. And people are saying, why are we having so much change? It's because the world is changing. The computers uh, are changing the way we do business. So the Navy is simply trying to adjust to that. There are many parallel paths, and everything is happening at once. Is it all going to um, come together at one time? We hope so, okay? But in the meantime, it's best to just hang on and try to move along with the uh, tide that the Navy's decided to move on. I can't say this enough. I know that you need that ED, that .edu. I know that you need that to go out and access information. But from the Navy perspective, that's where you're going. So you need to figure out how to access, how to do those functions within the NMCI enclave. Okay, right now, there are hundreds of websites where you go get information. And you go out and you get your information a lot of them are just hot links or uh, reference uh, links that you end up going out there trying to get the different information. Instead, what would be our desire and what our kind of goal is out there in Utopia, if you will, is that you have your biggest type of information grid. You have your shore infrastructure over here, you have your at sea or your, um, excuse me, your field infrastructure over here. Right now, the Navy is committed to using NMCI for shore-based infrastructure. And for the afloat, and then for the Marines, will be IT21. What if you could log on with a common username into both IT21 and NCI? What if you could share data back and forth and replicate that data back and forth? A great example is Sam listed on uh, personnel when they work on a uh, Navy education course at work. And they work on it through the NMCI enclave. When they go home and they log on and they can be, uh, pick up wherever they left off, and the same, their data is saved, they don't have to go back, and it's all right there. 
What if uh, you can basically transfer the data back and forth by having authoritative data sources and, and data consolation? And that's where you talk about you're really trying to break rice bowls because if somebody has their own little database, what, who is actually going to determine who the authoritative database is? And you take away that power from that one person. And that's where basically Transfer's Web is causing a lot of headaches. We're telling people you can't maintain that private database anymore. You need to start merging. Or that merging, you are duplicating effort. That same data is being stored over by viewers, and they are the authoritative data source. So you basically need to merge your information and then get rid of that program. So this is what we're trying to do with the Navy. And this is the um, goal of, what we're, of Task Force Web. Now, obviously, all this is trying to work both from an operational and a business perspective. I'm trying to use the web so you can basically be interconnected and access those programs from anywhere in the world. What will this do? If we have a web-enabled Navy, what will it be the benefits? Why should we go through all this trouble? Well, first of all, you can access that information from wherever you are. You don't have to get back to that dedicated terminal. And you also improve air outability. By using XML, by using SAML, by using some of the industry standards, we're trying to put commonality across the board. We're also going to improve the information assurance by basically putting standards out there and making everybody abide by the standards. Think of it as we're trying to move the IT world from the wild, wild west to suburban America. We have rules, roads, sidewalks, and so forth, and you can't just do what you want. That's also what MCI is doing as well. We're pushing hard for single sign-on. In fact, we were at a meeting this morning with the uh, Finlock folks up the road. They developed an open source single sign-on product for us, and we're testing it. We've also gone out and uh, contracted for a uh, COTS product that we're testing on the Theodore Roosevelt Battlegroup right now. So this will help. This is also a big goal of programmers, to have a uh, single sign-on capability where you can basically sign on once, and you can work any different application you want that's inside the portal. And then once again, if you merge your data so you have an authoritative data source, then you're going to improve the quality of the information. Everybody knows the rule of uh, garbage in, garbage out, and how much you can really trust the internet because there's no authoritative source. We're trying to drive it by using those sources. Okay, the portal. How, how does this help you? How does this help? Why can't you say, why do I need a portal? I can go to this website, get this information. I can go to that website, get the information. That's true. But if on a day-to-day -day basis, say you're a division officer on a ship, or maybe you're on one of the staffs ashore, if you can move those functions, those programs, into a common portal that you can use, and then you can customize it so that all your daily needs are basically in one place, then that will really help you try to do your job. And that's what a portal does, is it aggregates, it brings together those different programs into one place so you're not constantly going around. Also, you can basically personalize it and only use the tools that you need. How many people have been on a ship? Raise your hand. How many people have been on ship tours? What kind of uh, internet connectivity do you have on a ship? Are you animal staff? Well, I just came from uh, US Kiosk, and at best, and we, we did web enabling the ship. That was actually my job on board the Kiosk. Right. Uh, at best, you're going to get uh, about 1.5K per second going to each. And, and that's on a carrier. That's a carrier. Right. Small boys, uh, they're really yeah. hurting. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's why they wanted Navy staff officers on this, um, on this command because they understood, truly understood how small the pipe is going to the ships. Okay. Uh, some people believe every ship has a T1 line. And as we know, that's obviously not true. So what we're doing with this portal is we're actually going to allow the portal and the services to be cached on the portal on the ship. Our um, plan is to put a portal on every ship in the Navy. We're also going to put portals around the United States and also in the Oconus uh, environment. That way, if you
the portal. Basically, once again, the key function is that <laughs> all those websites you used to go to to get information, you can aggregate that content into your workplaces so you can use it. You can also basically personalize it so you can make this portal look and feel so that it's what you want. It's what you want to see on a day-in, day-out basis. We've given you options for customizing it. We can have, for example, say you tend to work on a ship in a command center where it's dark most of the time, or maybe up on the bridge or so. We have uh, different types of um, backgrounds where you customize it for low lighting and so forth. So a lot of thought has gone into making it Navy friendly. We also are working hard to try to minimize the load on this. A lot of um, application owners don't worry about um, throughput. They don't worry about how much time it's going to take you to get the data. And you know as well as I do that if you click on something and you have to wait a couple minutes for that information to come, you're going to walk away. So what we've done is when we work with these um, program developers to make them bring their um, application into the portal, we try to make them think really hard on what you really need to make this application work. And in doing that, with the portlet concept, we make it so that when the portlets come up, you have some sort of uh, flexibility that you can actually do something in that small portlet. You don't have to maximize every portlet every time to do your job, but instead, you can go quick search on a small size portlet. So you can have multiple portlets on your screen and still be functional. How many people have logged into the official US Navy website? What do you hear when you log in that website? Ding, 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 ding. You know how much uh, bandwidth it takes to bring all that across? We're trying to get people to focus on not doing that stuff. Get rid of the bells and whistles. Make it purely functional because we understand that uh, bandwidth constraints on the ship. So what we're trying to do is basically make it so that it's, it's usable. It's what they need out there in the fleet. Well, now this is an example of a commercial product. But the idea also is to pick the key functions there so you can actually do your job. One, one part that comes in with that is there may be a program out there that does some function incredibly well. The problem is it's that one key function that's useful and the rest is duplicated by a very common product, maybe like Microsoft Word or something like that. We're trying to basically force that function to be migrated over and then get rid of the rest of the program. We only want to use those key functions that are unique. And we don't need to be duplicating programs just because uh, they were developed a long time ago before more common products came along. So we want to integrate the data and be able to use it so you can actually do your job. As I mentioned today, you can actually access this portal, and I'll show you the um, URL in just a second. There are uh, instantiations in Norfolk and on ships. We do have secure web access, so those um, users that have gone into NFCI into the enclave can actually access the portal because the portal is outside MCI, and that way they can come outside and access it and they do it so through secure web access. So it is up and running today and right there is the URL. Please feel free to log on and uh, you can basically get um, yourself a username and a password. We are actively looking for input from everybody in the Navy as to programs that you think are good candidates for web enabled. Right now, we're still at um, the beginning. We're in the first half of our program. And as our um, director, Ms. Shepard, says, the first to the trough get to eat. Okay? <laughs> so right now, we have testing facilities. We have some programming support. We have um, people standing by. Like I said, your echelon true rep is the Lieutenant Commander of Pierre Granger. They can help support you. If you have programs that you know are not going to be supported in the future by NMCI and are possibly on the cutting block for funding, and now is the time to web enable them. And now is the time to start coming to us and see if you can take those programs so you can still have that functionality in the future. <laughs> As I said before, we are doing installs this uh, spring and basically trying to work through some of the lessons learned. So we're still kind of, we've moved beyond the pilot stage, but we're still basically in a beta testing phase as we try to get more and more content onto the portal. All right, let's talk a little bit about this. Let's get specific. How do you comply with Task Force Web? You actually get, we try to put as much stuff out there on the web as you can. We've developed a rather detailed Navy Enterprise Application Developer's Guide. 100 and, how many pages? 50-some? Yeah, it's about 150. 150 pages. It has code in it. It's very detailed. It basically, it's for the programmers, not for the manager, not for the executives. It's for programmers to exactly show them what they need to do to take their program, convert to XML, and bring it into the portal. You can also go into the 
um, workplace there on the portal, and you can review how our architecture is built. You can ask questions, and then finally, what you need to do, once you've gone through the first three steps and understand what is re are required of Taskless Web, then the key thing for most program users is to develop a UFS, a user-facing service, that will modify your application to work within the portal. We are making this portal generic through a portal connector in which basically any program can come access it. It doesn't have to be programmed in, you know, using certain types of um, uh, code or so forth. Finally, most of this information is right here. It's our open source um, information there. And this is a wealth of information. You can even go and pre-test your portal, I mean, sorry, your application here and make sure and see how it works up and then that's before you even go to the labs. So we've tried, to, we've tried to bend over backwards for the developers because we understand very much that the average uh, developer in a command is overworked, underpaid, and doesn't have a lot of staff. So we're trying to make it uh, helpful to them. You also, once you do that uh, user-facing service, you can modify the output and you need to make the guidelines. And once again, that's all spelled out there in that open source. And then you go test it. You go test it within our labs and you submit a package. So take advantage of Granger is the officer designated to handhold you and walk you through this process. If you have any questions and everything, he can basically come and work with you through and help guide you on the process. We've dedicated an officer to every H1 to in the Navy and basically try to help you if you get confused or if you have questions. So we are, and once again, now is a good time to be submitting um, programs and applications because we are looking for content. Later on, once we've gotten a couple hundred um, programs in the system, then we're going to start reviewing, we're going to start reading out, and we're going to start being much more critical, saying, well, we already have that function, or we already have that activity. It almost goes back to the VHS and beta. Mm -hmm. Beta was um, superior, technologically, right? Mm -hmm. But which one are we using now? VHS. Mm -hmm. So basically, the function or activity of the program that gets there first is probably going to be the one that stays in the portal for the waters. Here is showing um, example right here, once again, the open source and all the different resources that are out there to help you work through and to bring in your application into the portal. And I'll leave this brief here and uh, I guess you have a um, shirt dryer you can shoot as well. Great. Ongoing development. We're not standing still. We're trying to push hard. We still have 18 months left in the life of this command. And so we're trying to once again move forward. We, we're wanting to ensure this portal is hardware independent. And in fact, we're also even looking at uh, building an open source portal so that we can try to experiment that way. Uh, right now we're doing uh, a bake off between JetSpeed and UPortal and uh, we're working through that with uh, MITRE. We're also developing this single sign-on product, both a COTS and a GOTS solution. Heavily work with PKI. As everybody knows in information assurance, there's basically three things what you are, what you know, and what you have. We're working on those. Uh, work with biometrics and see if we can, uh, so we're trying to do a lot of experimentation, okay? Not trying to solve world peace, but just simply working to try to make this thing as usable as possible. And uh, obviously work with this and mobile code and so forth. So lots of different things. Now let's talk reality, especially the guys who've been on the Navy. You know how the Navy works there. That if you say you're a program, and you're only going to be around for three years, what's the average bureaucrat going to do? Stall. Wait you out. And in fact, we've had bureaucrats that say, you're only around for three years, we're going to wait until you're gone. Mm -hmm. Well, that's fine. But I, I think if you look at the uh, way the Navy's going, even when we go away, the functions that we're doing and the issues that we're pressing are going to continue on the Navy. I mean, just look at the tremendous efforts going on with NMCI, Net Morcom, and so forth. We actually have a transition plan to take all the function activities we're doing and pass them on to different commands. Most of the network comms, some to CFFC, some to So the train is moving, you know, and you can kind of basically not step on it now, but eventually web enabling is the way to go. This is the right thing to do. Also, there's been some messages recently, just last month, came out from network comm, talking about all these different issues that we're working. I'm not sure if you saw them, but Legacy application reduction is a huge issue. When they first did the survey um, a year and a half ago for NMCI, they had 68,000 applications or programs that the Navy had. They reduced that down by 90%. Now we're down to about 7,000, which is still a tremendous amount. They had people using um, Word Perfect 4.2 out there. 
I mean, Harvard graphics. So, you know, it's because one person had never upgraded, they still like to use them. We've done the easy kills. Now it's the hard ones, okay? We're trying to go through. So, in fact, that war column, like I said, messed up the legacy application work. They're going to start doing kill lists. So instead of you having a save list, they're going to put everything on the kill list, and you have to justify why you need to spend money to keep that legacy application. Also, the second message basically came out and reiterated that Task Force Web was on the right track, and that everybody you know, still needs to start working on web enabling. There's a threat hanging over a lot of commands that basically, if you don't web enable your applications, you're going to lose your funding. So a lot of bureaucrats can try to wait us out, but once again, I think that the uh, writing's on the wall, and eventually that's the right way to go. The bottom line is we are here to help, and okay? we're not asking you for money. And in fact, we're trying to hear asking for support, uh, or we're asking to help support you. If you have uh, students that want to try new research projects, we'd like to work with you. If you have a pet program or pet application that you'd like to be web enabled, we're here to help. If you want to try as a um, Instructor, professor, try to do research and work with us. We're here to help as well. Uh, Lieutenant Correct, if you stand up for a second. Uh, Raj has been on here. He's actually one of our technical leads, and he's here basically to um, do some other work. And I dragged him in here because he's also on our team. We'll be here for, I guess, the next 30 minutes or an hour or whatever. If anybody wants to talk and have questions, we have cards to hand out. And right now, I'm open to any general questions that people might have. function at the Echelon 2 level, mm -hmm. okay? And the idea was that we work through Echelon 2s and then they go down there 3s and 4s. So it's an administrative, not operational commands. And so, because typically your Echelon 2 will be where they're the program owners for the different applications. Um, can we give an example of the minus and how you're trying to work with the minus and how that would affect different um, ships and commands as far as it's an application that we're trying to... I mean, yeah, I, th I think I understand what you're talking about for that. It's just Right now, I'm working with the uh, the was the ERP. I can't remember what it stood for. It's the <coughs> Enterprise Resource Program. That's a that's a that's a, a huge program that the Navy is doing. We're working on one specific piece that's going to help the shipboard and the shore environments for maintenance on ships. And so what we're working at the the basically the lower levels with the individual programmers working with the vendors because they've chosen SAP as their product. And I was like, well, we need to do this, and we need to web enable it. Well, how do we do that? How is security going to be implemented? What are your security requirements? How can, we, how can we help, and who do we need to point them to? For example, PMW 161 at Spaywar, their information assurance director, well, we've, we can focus a lot of their requirements. Hey, these are the requirements this program needs to implement. How do we do this? How do we do this in a web enabled fashion? So it goes all the way up from all the way up top, all the way down, well, now we've got the frigate. How are they going to implement this? Mm -hmm. How is this going to work? I come from submarine force. How is this going to work on the submarine? <laughs> Where there's, okay, less than zero connectivity. Let yeah. mm -hmm. me give you another example. Tomorrow I'm briefing over the library. Uh -huh. And there's, there's 340 libraries in the Navy on ships, on shores, overseas, and so forth. <laughs> they have a multitude of different commercial programs they use for library catalog. Mm -hmm. And so I'm working with the library in the Navy, and we're going to basically have a uh, cook-off, a bake-off. So I'm, the library program we have here is Cersei, and I'm going to go and review it because it's somewhat web enabled. And then we're going to go and we're going to go to all these different uh, commercial uh, product owners, right. and we're going to say, here's the requirements that the librarians, the Navy librarians, have come up with 34 different requirements that they want this program to do to comply with NFCI and be web enabled. And we're going to ask them to do that and on their own job. Because, and then once they do that, then the library of the Navy will suggest to the rest of the library of the Navy, all 340 of them, this is our preferred product that you buy. Mm -hmm. And it will meet both the MCI and web and um, so yes. Are you mostly in the administrative board and staying away from tactical? Uh, to an extent, yes, because many of the tactical um, programs are very specific and they're time critical. And you know, um, they're done on certain machines. Uh, we are trying to be uh, operational on some, but right now, the biggest number of applications that really need to be weeded out are on the 
administrative um, side. Now, when you say administrative, it can be very broad because you know supply gets into that, um, view programs and so forth. Um, a lot of quality of life programs, and so that's where we see that we can make the biggest uh, emphasis. Um, and that's why mainly we're working with Echelon Two is the administrative side. We're not trying to go into like a weapon system and web enable that. We're not, that that's all. That's a whole different world. So yes. Are you guys uh, using something like LDAP for your single sign-on? I believe you called it. Well, a single sign-on. Oh, um, right, right. Single sign-on could be done by a variety of things. We have like the concept that we have right now is a triad between you have single sign-on, you have the PKI public key infrastructure, and then you have the directory service. So there's actually all three of those have to work together in order to form an adequate single sign-on product or actually adequate single sign-on uh, method. So you can well, but, but well, to answer yeah. the specific question, NESO, or open source, is using LDAP. Oblix, our commercial product, uses Active Directory. Well, we just LDAP based. Right. I mean, they're all, they're all very similar. The, the directory services are based on LDAP, yeah. which is an open standard. Right. But to answer your question on that aspect. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm limited in my knowledge of XML, but I understand there's a lot of overhead associated with it. How is that being mitigated in terms of the bandwidth to the ships? Um, Just like Mark Rosler. <laughs> well, it depends on what, how they use the XML. I mean, a lot of the, we've seen XML sort of slap files. We sort of we've seen XML, and I've developed that XML that actually gets transferred to the browser which then uh, gets processed by the client side. Now, ultimately, the goal is to actually have these individual distributed clients everywhere process whatever they need to do. For example, if I'm at a terminal, the XML comes to the terminal and gets processed here, and so it gets processed and all that stuff is weighted, and weighed on by the user because he requested it, as opposed to being doing server side. But the consistency and what we have in the Navy application realm right now with all the computers, you can have varying levels of computing power out on a ship. You can have everything from a 386 all the way up to the, like the highest penny three that's also out there. And there's no way to tell because there's the configuration management, which is another issue that we raise up with Space War, needs to be all the same. And that's what NMCI is doing on the shore side, is configuration management and ensuring, well, this is the workstation that a minimum user will use. So to address your XML issue, we're working, we're trying to do it the best we can with everything that we have out there. So at present, our thought is with XML is to do it process server side and send HTML back to the browser. So that's the way we do it right now, but that can change. And that's what we're looking at to see how we can change that and going through that. The overhead you're talking about could vary up for the computer itself. I mean, it, it could be huge or it could not be. I was thinking more in respect to, yeah, you're sending stuff on like the UHS or like a ship or something like that. We sat on this maybe on this. That you have a lot of right. formatting into, into your package and that sort of thing. Right. That's really the problem. And that's where the whole concept of having a portal, whatever the ship is, so you can actually catch those important critical programs if you're not constantly going back and forth. Um, also, the uh, program developers are basically have three different um, ways that they can integrate as, as easily as a reference link, hot link, or as deeply involved as a uh, content uh, integration where you have a uh, look and feel just like those formulas and it has cascading style sheets and so forth. So um, there's different levels that they go when they're developing the program. Um, there's one, actually, right here. I have a question. Uh, some say that 50% uh, of the world uh, uh, uses Windows 95. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, 
suppose you've got a cached portal. Um, now, how much database, you, you talked about having centralized databases and putting all the data in one place. If, if you have the database um, somewhere in Tennessee or something sure. like that, your, your portal becomes disconnected uh, and it needs to be refreshed. Uh, are you going to do some form of selective refresh? How are you going to, to make sure that your portal is, is In fact, that's a, that's a very good question. We're, um, they're looking at a uh, concept of data warehouses for one when they do state consolidation. And they're also looking at how you do data refreshment. I mean, um, if you've been on the ship, you know that, uh, that a lot of the uh, pumps have been replaced by CD-ROMs. Well, in fact, the Naval Warfare Development Center has been, has been under an order by this October to get rid of CD-ROMs. Even though CD-ROMs only cost a little bit, it's still, when you distribute those things four times a year to every ship and every command, it still adds up. So they're looking at going web enabling as well. Now, there's a trick with that because when you have changes, basically have to send out the changes. So they're looking at how to parse the data so that you basically break a pub down into paragraphs and we only have to change out the deltas. And so that's a, a kind, of, I'm not sure if that's full answer, but that's one thing we're looking at is where you can basically try to only send out the deltas or the changes. And that involves uh, using XML to basically try to work along those issues. So there, there's a lot of questions. There's more questions than there are answers to this. So. <laughs> Are the deltas being pushed as they happen, or is it up to a, to a timeout value of the recipients and to say, this, this is likely old now, I better check for deltas? It's going to be pushed. It's going to be pushed out. Pushed as they as they. And, they're, and actually, to tell you, the guys in Newport are still trying to figure this out, because they got this directive last October, and they are the gun to scramble them, because, um, and also for us, we're not going to have a portal on every ship between now and then. So they're going to use uh, CAS Collaboration City, if you're familiar with that, to do this initial install. And literally what they're going to do is they're going to do one last CD wrong push mm -hmm. on 1 October, and they're going to say save it, and then we're going to start pushing changes out through the cast. Is it collaboration on the East Coast? Or the no. I thought it was a lot of Right. Um, that's, that's the understanding I was. So suppose you push, and the portal's down. Well, so you keep pushing until the portal acknowledges? Oh. We expect there to be gaps where uh, a ship goes in time. I mean, say you have a time launcher goes out to their basket and launches it, they're going to go in time and stuff. So we expect that there's going to be a time where they're going to come back and they're going to have to replicate their data. And, th and then they're going to have to try to get time at night, or they might even have to wait until they go in the port. And think about it, though. I mean, yes, the doctrine is crucial to what you're doing, but I'm not sure it's that crucial that you need it every minute. So you can actually wait days or even weeks to update for your pubs the material. So you actually almost wait to go to port, and then you get the T1 line, and then you end up replicating all the data and that you know, along those lines. And don't forget, there's also a tremendous effort by Spa War to get bigger pipes. I mean, they are working hard on bandwidth issue, but until then, we're going to rely on um, nighttime pushes or ports or whatever they can. Uh, how about the back? Um, how are you going to do with concurrency? Because if you're doing pushes and say one ship comes in, they make their changes, they send them up, how do you know? on time-wise, whose data is the most current? I mean, that even happens in the civilian world, sure. that you have database, you know, you're going to get dirty data if you're not careful when one ship comes in, okay, I've updated it, I send it off, and then somebody else sends it right, you know, after them that has older data right. than they have. How are you going to take that into account? Like I said, um, there's more questions than answering. That sounds like a great research project, though. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can answer something. Collaboration C, which is basically let us domino, uh, up on the ships right now. They have run into that issue with that, with uh, basically just coll collisions of two people trying to update the same file at the same time, who wins? Well, right now with them, the last one wins. So it, it'll, it'll actually overwrite, and that, that's the issue that we have with that. They're still trying to figure out exactly what's the best way to do this, because not everything can go one way or the other. There are some things that, depending on the application, depending on the data that needs to be updated, you have to look at it and see the appropriate replication scheme and the appropriate contingency that needs to be taken. So that, 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 that varies. The, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but with NCI, as it was uh, established, maybe it's going to change over time, but did not have access uh, to civilian agencies outside of NCI. Now, on the ship, are we going to have uh, access outside that portal to civilian the, um, the way we were structured is that our portal, we're going to have portals inside the NMCI enclave. 
So if you're inside there, you can access the portal because you're already inside there. Each ship's going to have one, so you're going to be inside IT 21. And then um, once the contract gets led, we'll also have portals in the BLII, which is the old Conus construction, the 18 knocks that they're building, or uh, I, I knocks so they're building around the world. So the idea is no matter where you're at, you can get out of portal. And so, and also, NFCI uses secure web access, so you can basically get in and get out. Are, are, are you out and use that at all? Uh, no, I'm not sure. Okay, because uh, basically secure web access allows you with a PKI server to basically, uh, we have NFCI on our machine, we're able to get in and get out. Pretty, uh, pretty easily now. So I think right here. Was one. Well, uh, the general question that came up as a side issue was the question she asked about, um, you know, the whole task force uh, web issue it brings a lot more questions, yes, yes. And is leading to uh, research opportunities. Is task force web in some kind of relation with the school to address to, to get some of these? Uh, well, I think um, Commander uh, Commander Tina Swallow is our ops officer. Um, I don't know if she's conversed with you, but I know she has conversed with some people because we had a grad student. You know that was in the talk of oh, the commander. Um, I don't we had one of your grad students. Hey, what's her name? Uh, commander Tina Swallow. And I, I can give you her number. Um, okay. She's our ops officer. And we actually had one of the grad students from here mm -hmm. out in our office space just two weeks ago, right? That's right. Uh, he was doing his thesis, and it was also, he was also in the information professional community. Okay, so anyway, we had one of your students out there already, and we're yes, we get faculty involved, so you've got good research topics there about the timing and synchronization of updates. And we welcome that, we do, and if we can talk offline afterwards, we'll give you her name and all the information you can go from there. So, how went back there? Went back. I just have a very general level questions. What what platform are you using? Like uh, you talk about web services, and you using like K2E, Java type of. Uh, you don't uh, like uh, <laughs> Okay. Well, uh, it, right now, what we did is we took, uh, took the space war base installation of what they were using, which is basically Windows 2000 server for the operating system. On top of that, we actually used VEA Web Logic 7.0 Service Pack One for the J2E engine. Uh, using Sun's JVM on it. So we have that portion of it, and then the Clever Path Portal 401, which actually runs it inside the BEA web logic as, as a J2E component, right, for the Java component. So it runs that. And that's essentially the kind of the, the, the reference of the frame of the, everything. Then they customize the little templates and all that stuff, and all the fancy stuff that you see there. But it should be hardware and software neutral, right? It is hardware and software neutral on that aspect. I mean, this is physically what you're asking low level, this is low level, right? Yeah. So then the database itself is actually Windows 2000 server again on another machine running SQL 2000, SQL Server 2000. And, and that, that's the database that actually sits on the back end. And you'd be talking like this. Now, we've designed it in such a way that each of these is supposed to be removable. So, like, if WebLogic is not the appropriate product of choice, we take another J2E engine, such as WebSphere. Mm -hmm. Perhaps even a modification with a Azure Tomcat and stick in some other JTE components to make it JTE compliant and go from there. And so we made it modular and the components are replaceable on that aspect. And you think WebLogic because it supports all the security protocol, or just because it happened to be there? Well, um, more like it, we when we actually initially started Task Force Web in the portal. You have to go way back when the initial task force web stuff started. We actually worked with NMCI and EDS and ISF, which is the Information Strike Force. We presented them a set of requirements. We need these requirements met. And they were our hired contractor. Well, okay, let me pick out some products and I can do this. They picked out CA Clever Path. They picked out BA Web Logic. They picked out Windows 2000. They picked out a lot of the stuff to start off with. And so, and then we just carried it over from there. So that's how these things were chosen. Because they went through their, I guess, proprietary selection process and all that stuff, and went through and said these were the best products for what you were trying to do, and then went on from there. But what, what, one thing to amplify, we're just leaving out though, and this is reality here as well. We're not working with NFCI right now. They went off contract last May for Task Force Web because they were asking more money than we were willing to pay. So Raj and two other lieutenants were tasked to develop an alternate source until they came back on contract. So the port we're using now is built by three, by three lieutenants, one of them is an IP. And so 
we're, as we speak, we just had a two-day meeting back with NMCI if they, they want to come back and get back on the contract. They've had a change of uh, leadership. And they wrote, and plus, they're also on contract to develop the portal as well. So um, eventually, we will be working with NMCI and BLI, but there's been some, as you well know, political and fiscal issues that come along. So um, was there one way back to your question, Mayor? Okay. Um, I just want to ask, are you using I'm sorry. I, I, Are you using entity beans or session beans? For the Clever Path portal itself? For JTB. For JTB, actually, we don't use a single JTB function in the B- B- web launch. Okay. <laughs> because I can run that whole thing in Tomcat without any additional yeah. effort. So it's just sort of a, a, a glorified sort of, sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, back to the, there was a question on conflicts and updates. Yes. And as I understood from your presentation, all content has a single authority. That's the goal. Right? So how is it possible that you're getting conflicting updates? Uh, it seems that they timestamp them. Then right. It's, it's, it's there's a difference between goal and reality. We're going to have to fight. We're going to have to kind of work a major bureaucratic war to get people to give up their uh, uh, right. Because, I mean, lot, I mean, there's tremendous. How many, how many people have different? When you check into a ship or check into an aviation squad, how many times do you have to fill out your name, your social security number? <laughs> right? so, I mean, everybody's got their own database. Mm-hmm. And so trying to get rid of some of those databases is going to be very hard. It, it's rice bowls. So until we get there, we will have different d- databases. I apologize. I came in a little bit late. But, um, so if you've already answered it, I can get answered later. Um, but is there any guidelines right now say, I want to create an application that I think will help Navy-wide, and I want sure. to submit it to you? Um, we have the brief here. And on the brief, it okay. talks about all that. It has open source. And uh, we can get that to you. Thanks. Question for you, Charles. Working with Spain or GDS transmission? Um, I don't know. There was um, Lieutenant Commander Howard yes. Pace who was working on those issues, right? Yes. Yeah. The, the, the answer to the question is yes, they are working on GDS and then using that as a transmission medium to get to some of the ships also. Of course, that has to still be implemented, all the hardware testing, so on and so forth. So We're actually not so counting on that. We're counting on what we have today. Uh, I'd like to concern my sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm.